you guys interested in hearing a current speaking from the Lord? There's something about the current of God's river, the current of the river is in the current speaking. You see the play on words there? When we find the current voice, we get in the current of his presence. And so this is very important for us, not just collectively, but individually. You will find in your life that your life will find a ease in the current speaking. What does that mean? That means if you hear the Lord and give time and attention to his voice, his voice will come in like breath from heaven and grab you and take you and fulfill its own purposes. The scripture says that in Isaiah, his word will not return to him without accomplishing the thing for which it was sent. In other words, when God speaks a thing, that very speaking empowers its own fulfillment. This is why it is so important for you to hear God in your life. Why? Because if you do not hear him, you get out of the current. And how many of you have ever swam upstream before? It's not near as easy. As a matter of fact, you find yourself struggling and pushing and pressing and not making any advancement whatsoever. Many Christians live this way. That's why they get tired and worn out. That's why they're not happy. When I go different places and I preach and I get to meet a lot of the body of Christ, especially in Europe, even Spanish countries and all over the US, people ask me, what's the main thing that you see in the body of Christ in different regions of the world? Do you wanna know that answer? I find that a lot of the church is miserable. What do you mean? They're not happy. They're not full of joy. They're not bursting on the inside with an eternal life that spews out of them. Most of them are dragging their way through, trying their best to grip a cross, grit their teeth, and do their best to obey black and white. That's the majority of Christianity. But to talk about the actual infusion from the Spirit that makes a man burst with joy and burst with peace and love effortless in life, this is few and far between. And I want to talk to you about the reason why I believe that is. Okay? In Galatians, we see Paul talking to them about a result of the presence of God. It's in chapter five. He says, the fruit of the spirit. No, you just said the result of the presence of God. Well, the fruit of the spirit is the result of the presence of God. The spirit is God's presence and the fruit is the result of God's spirit. So as we receive the spirit, then the spirit is able to quicken and be God's nature through you. I want you to notice something. It doesn't say the fruits of the spirit. It says the fruit of the spirit. In other words, his character and his nature begins to fully come out of the one who gives attention to his presence. The presence of God is genuine spirituality. It's genuine Christianity. You take out the presence of God and all you've got left is an idea. I know many people that are so loyal to their idea of God. But to say they experience God, is a, that, that's a whole nother ball game. You can tell someone who has the presence of God in their life by the mark of joy. Why? Because the Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
Guys, I grew up in the church. I literally, my dad was a pastor all my life. He's still one to this day. I went to Christian school. I went to Sunday school. I heard the gospel every week on Wednesday night, on Sunday morning. I knew all the pastors. I was in the mix of churchianity all of my life. But I did not know God. <laughs> I could have told you what the gospel was. I could have told you different things about the Bible. Again, I went to Christian school. I learned the Bible, but I did not meet God. And I fear that the majority of people that I get to meet around the world, they know about God, but they don't know God. We're going to talk about the difference between the two. You see, when Jesus manifested himself to me, everything switched. It was as if my ears started to hear and my eyes started to see and my ability to perceive since God came alive. As a matter of fact, I want you to take a look at John 5. Look at this. John 5, verse 12. 1 John 5, verse 12. You don't have to turn there if you don't want to. I don't hear any pages turning. I'll just read it to you. All right. 1 John 5, 12 says this. He who has the Son has life. Say life. He who has the Son has life. He who has not the Son has not life. I want you to say again, life. Now, this is the same word that is used when the Bible says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So you see that there's something about this life that is very important. If God sent his son to give you this life, then it's very important. And he who has the son has this life. Whoever does not have the son does not have this life. If you turn to John 10, verse 10, Jesus says, I have come to give you life. There's something about this L-I-F-E, this life that is very important. And it's this, okay? The ability to perceive God is impossible without it. In other words, if you took a dead man and you laid him on the ground and you started to speak into his ear, can he hear you? He cannot hear you because there's no life in the ear. You can wave in front of him, open up his dead eye and wave in front of him. He's not going to see you because there's no life in the eye. The seeing of the eye is because of life in the eye. You take the life out, it cannot see. Are you understanding what I'm saying? To know God means you have an experience, not had an experience, but have an ongoing experience of him. That's why life was given to you. So that you could experience and live by a continuous experience of this wonderful, matchless Savior who's a lover beyond all lovers, who's more kind than anybody you have ever met, whose very presence fulfills every ounce of your being, whose voice puts to death all the passions of your soul. I'm telling you right now, it is Jesus and Jesus alone that can make a man like himself. And it comes from experiencing him. If you were to turn to John 17, verse 3, you would see that the Bible says, Jesus says, this is eternal life, to know him. So this is the essence of what he came to give you, the ability to be able to experience him. And then from that, from that experience of him, to come to know him. If we miss it here it don't matter how good you got it on the outside. 
It doesn't matter if your church attendance is perfect and you got your Bible scholarship up on the wall and you got your, your lingo is all correct. If there's no experience knowing God, then you don't have life. Because life itself gives you the ability to perceive him. And now you live by knowing him. So when I came into life, when I received life from God, what began to happen was the ability to perceive God came into my being and I became extremely addicted to it. I became addicted to the way that it feels when I give attention to him. I feel as if the inside man or the inside person that lives on the inside of me is romantically dancing with God, touched by his own hand and kissed by his own lips. I'm telling you, if you want to taste heaven, then let him kiss you with the kisses of his mouth. If you want to feel heaven, then you let him hold you in his arms. I'm telling you right now, this is the real deal. When Jesus whispers into your ears and begins to draw you away with him, that's the real deal. In Song of Solomon, we see that the whole book of Song of Solomon starts off with this, let him kiss me. That's a sweet, intimate, direct contact with God. And then it ends with, they'll be united forever. We see this whole love relationship of experience, of love between a starry-eyed bride and a romantic king is simply this. That by being kissed by him, he makes us walk out or walk into oneness with him. Maybe these things that I'm saying to you right now are like, I've never really even thought about it like this. I'm just trying to come here to the service and, you know, maybe... Worship for a little while, hear a good word, I want to go home. Maybe that's how you are right now. I'm telling you, if your life doesn't have an inward pulling to come away with him, I doubt whether or not you've ever seen how beautiful he is. I doubt that you've ever felt the sweet embrace of his presence. I come to you, O oh precious love of mine. Your lips drip with honey and your kiss is like wine. <laughs> your voice is so tender and your eyes are always so kind. Your touch is bliss to me. I leave everything behind. Because everything in thee I find. I'm telling you that right there. That language, that heart exchange, this longing for him and this experience of him and this enjoyment of him is genuine Christianity. That's being a son of God. That's being the bride of Christ. You miss it here and you missed it. Let me just talk to you a little bit about how easy it is to miss it. Did you know that John the Apostle was over the church of Ephesus. Did you know that? Well, now you do. John the, the apostle, the one who laid his head upon the chest of Christ, the one who gained access to the divine treasure chest by laying his head upon Christ's breast. This one was over the church in Ephesus. But when John goes on, the church continues and Jesus writes a letter to them to address their condition after John had gone on. Do you want to know what it is? This, this letter that Jesus wrote to them, he specifically calls out to them that they had left their first love. But before he tells them that they left their first love, he tells them that their discipline is great. He goes, you guys have your discipline in order. You guys don't mess with sin at all. If there's even a cloud, you abandon it. He says, you have no tolerance for evil. He says, your doctrine is so clean that when somebody comes that has dirt in their doctrine, you're able to expose them. Jesus says, these are good things. And they're positive. But he says, I gotta tell you something. You're missing the heart of the issue. Because I don't have your heart anymore. 
In other words, what Jesus is trying to say is that even your disciplines and your doctrine and your sense of duty and your soldier mentality of storming the beachhead and accomplishing God's purposes in the earth, even these things fall miserably short of giving Jesus what he wants from you, and it is your heart. He wants your love. If there's anything God has been crying out for from the very beginning, it's your heart. When he, when he first called out a people and he wanted to build a whole people on them, what's the first foundation that he said? He goes, oh, love me with all of your heart. I'm telling you, there's people in this room right now that you know this love and it's not there anymore. You know what it is to be in the kitchen and you're walking through and all of a sudden your heart just gets touched by him and you begin to worship and say, oh, how I honor you and I, I enjoy you and I worship you. I'm telling you, the Lord wants your heart again. And there's people in this room right now that you don't even know what I'm talking about. But I'm telling you, I have really good news for you. Tonight, he is here and he is more beautiful than anything you have ever seen before. I'm telling you right now, you will be stricken breathless by the overwhelming conviction that he's unlike anything at all. He stands in a category all by himself. The sound of his voice changes your person. The literal feeling of his nearness fulfills your existence. I'm telling you right now, there's a person in the scripture that understood this. And her name was Mary of Bethany. And she's named three times in the scriptures. And what Jesus says of this woman is something he never said of anybody else. And remember, Jesus is God, right? And God looked at a woman who never preached a sermon, who never taught a Sunday school class, who never performed a miracle. And he said, what this woman has done will be told as a testimony of her everywhere the gospel is preached around the world. Jesus says, I'm connecting my gospel to this woman because I want the world to see in her life what the gospel should bring everybody to. Do you want to know what she did? What was it about her? I remember when I first started seeing her and watching the scriptures unfold these beautiful stories about this woman. I was like, God, what is it? Why do you have so much favor towards her? I felt like the Lord said to me, she loved me. And I said, Lord, but so many people have loved you. Why her? What is it about her? So he took me into the scriptures and he showed me all three times that she's mentioned in the scriptures. And he began to show me that every single time she is mentioned, she's at his feet. She lives a life of adoration. The very first time she's ever mentioned, I want you to picture this. She's in a house. Now, Jesus is famous at this time. The blind are seeing, the lame are walking. People from all over want to be where he is. They're laying out trying to be around him. He's got to get in a boat and go somewhere else. So he's super famous. And he's inside of a house. So I'm sure it's packed out with people. So picture it in your mind. A whole mess of people looking at Jesus. Some believe he is the son. Some don't. Some are talking trash about him. Others are just looking at him like, what, could this be him? But then right smack in the middle of the room, there's this woman. And she's seated at his feet and she's looking up at him and she's staring she's fixed and she's listening to his words this is the first time this wonderful woman is mentioned in the scriptures and the lord is saying to me see you see she looks at me i have all of her attention she gives me her ear she listens to my words. She's taken with me. She's, 
She's literally transfixed. This is him whom my soul has longed for. And I look at him and I listen to him. And it doesn't matter what anybody thinks. It doesn't matter how other people see me. It doesn't matter what people say about me. He is too beautiful to look away from. And I'm taken with him. She's captivated. And because she's so captivated, Jesus looks at her and he is taken with her love for him. And he says, this guy's, you see this woman, everywhere the gospels preach, this one, her whole life I want to be remembered. Look at her. The second time that she's mentioned, her brother has just died. Literally, she's in the middle of a tragedy. And she had asked for him to come and he didn't come. And so she's in, the, she's in the middle of all these kind of feelings that you would probably have your own self. I just don't know why didn't he answer? Where is he? What's going on? He shows up. You know who the first person is to meet him is? Mary's sister, Martha. You know what Martha says? She says, where you been at? You know what Jesus says to her? He begins to talk to her. She talks back to him. She even brings up theology. She's like, I know he'll resurrect on the last day. Jesus looks at her and he goes, I, I am the resurrection. Then you know what he says? He says, where's Mary? He's looking for her. Because he knew that if she would come to him, he would get exactly what he's looking for. He's not looking for dialogue. He's not looking for theology. He's not looking for a debate. He's not looking for the smartest person. He's looking for one who will look at him and give him all of their attention and let their heart go up and set their little heart on top of his big heart and ex exchange a love beyond anything this world has to offer. So they go get married and they say, the master is here. He's looking for you. He's looking for you. This moves me, man. The last thing I want is for Jesus to say to me, go get so-and-so. <laughs> I want to be Mary. And you know what she does when she sees him? She says the same exact beginning phrase that Martha did. But you know what she does immediately with all of these questions that she has? She throws them all down at his feet with her own life. And she worships. In other words, your presence here is greater than answers to my questions. The last time she's mentioned in the scriptures. Oh, God wants, guys, I'm telling you, God wants your heart. I can feel it in my stomach. I feel it. The Lord is longing for you. He longs to be longed for. He seeks to be sought. He's looking for one who will give him their attention and their time. I'm not one that's looking for him to do something for them. I'm not one to, that, that, that comes to him to try to manipulate him, but one who literally wants him for him and all that he is to be enjoyed and to be experienced and to have and to hold until death do us part. This reality of marry me, this is the, this is the name of the Lord for you. Marry me. So Mary, in the last time that she's mentioned, She's there, and there's a house again full of people, and she comes with an alabaster box of perfume, and she sees him. You know what she does when she sees him who her soul loves? She goes and she breaks the perfume, and she puts the perfume on his feet. Then you know what she does after that? 
she literally takes her hairs and wipes his feet with her hair. That's weird. Do you want to know why I believe she did that? It's because the wonderful thing is, is that even though Jesus had told the disciples, I'm going to die, none of them believed him. But when she heard he was going to die, she believed what he said and she anoints him for burial. No one else believed. She did. And this is the way of faith. Those that look to him, they receive from him. And they're able to believe things that others are not able to believe. Do you see, when she breaks that perfume on his feet and then takes her literal hair and wipes the perfume off with her hair, now she smells like him and he smells like her. I don't know if you understood what I just said, but they share the same fragrance. The glory of heaven now rests on her and his love and her love become a fragrance. And the Bible says that everyone in the room was able to smell the fragrance of their personal love exchange. I'm telling you, this is the real gospel. To break the alabaster box of your love on him so that his fragrance gets on you and now you together in union of experience become a fragrance for the world to be able to smell. The fragrance of life unto life to some and death unto death to others. Maybe these things I'm talking about right now are so far into you, you're literally like, I don't understand why in the world this dude is crying about some chick from back in the day. It's because she's an invitation for you. She's not written about so you'll know that there once was a woman like her. She's an invitation for you to be that woman also. So that a woman who never wrote a book, who never preached a sermon, who never performed a miracle, stole the heart of Jesus and he connected his own gospel to the testimony of her life to go out all over the world. Maybe you're here right now and you say to yourself, I don't know this, but I want this. I want to know him like this. I want to look at him. I want to experience his sweetness. I want to fall in love I want to fall in love with God. Maybe that's you here today. Maybe you've struggled for many years thinking, I just haven't been able to actually fall in love with God. I have been at the services, and I've learned so many new things, and I've adjusted my life. I'm telling you right now, you can change your life as much as you want, but it will never do what, it, what an exchange of life can do. You can try to fashion yourself and break off stuff and literally sign on the dotted line, this is now what I believe. But it still doesn't give him your heart. God's not collecting resumes in heaven saying, who fits the category? He's looking for those that he can see have been captivated by him. Mary of Bethany is a call to be captivated by thee. And thee alone. Is there any way I could get somebody to play for me? Like a pad, a strings or something. Just hold it down for me. We're closing out right here. This is why God sent me, guys. I could feel it up here. I, I don't know what, what you're feeling right now. But I know this. The word of the Lord has come to you today. And it is a joyous invitation to a romance with God that will thrill you beyond anything you could have ever even imagined. I'm talking about true ecstasies of his glory in your life. I'm talking about joy unspeakable.
I'm talking about peace that passes all understanding. I'm talking about the reality of God in the midst of your everyday life so that though nothing has changed in your earthly circumstance, everything is different because it's him. You feel me? We're gonna close out with a quick gospel and I'm also gonna ask anybody who wants this kind of love relationship with God to begin tonight. I'm gonna ask you to come down here in a minute. But before I do that, I wanna reach out to anybody here that does not know Jesus. Can you turn it up a little bit? We're closing out right here. Just give me your attention just for the last little bit. We're almost done. When I was in high, uh, uh, middle school, actually, my mom bought me a, a white Michael Jordan shirt, completely white with a Michael Jordan jump man on here. Do you guys know what I'm talking about when I say that? Okay. It was my favorite shirt. And I literally walked down the hallways of that school wanting everybody to see my shirt. I was like, you know, you guys check out my shirt, just walking around. Super happy about my shirt. When lunchtime came, I was a little careless with my spaghetti. And you know what happened all down the front of it. You know what I did? I ran to the restroom and I took some water and I put it on the stain. You know what happened, right? It just got worse. So I thought, I'll get soap. Soap clean stuff. So I got some soap and I put that on the stain. Now it was way worse. And I scrubbed and I scrubbed to get it out and it just, that was just making a mess. So you know what I did? I would, went to walk back to my class and I was no longer wanting everybody to see my shirt. I actually was kind of trying to hide my stain like this. Oh, so trying to just hide this whole area here that was messed up. So I'm, you know, walking around. The girls are coming by. I'm just like, no, nah, I can't hug you right now. I'm, I'm, I'm doing something. <laughs> I got home from school and my mom says to me, oh, Eric, how was your day? And I said, oh, mom, it was terrible. You know, the Jordan shirt you got me, I completely ruined it. She goes, oh, yeah, give me the shirt. I said, mom, you don't understand. I put water on it. She said, Eric, give me the shirt. I said, mom, no, no, I scrubbed and I scrubbed. And she changed her tone. She said, Eric, give me the shirt. So I took off that shirt and I surrendered it into the hands of my mom. She performed this miracle that only mothers really know how it's done. And she brought that stained shirt back to me, white as snow. My friends, I just preached the gospel to you. The Bible says, though your sins be red like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Maybe you've been here and you got a little careless in your life, with your thoughts, with your heart, with the way that you've been living your life, and you got stains on your life. And you've tried, even in your own strength, to try to scrub them out. You've tried to, I'm gonna get this out myself before anybody sees it. But the reality is you can't cover up your sin. You gotta get it washed clean. And there's only one way to do that. It's to surrender the stain to him who loves you and he will perform a miracle that only he really knows how it's done. And though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. And you will see that there is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the lamb. If you're here right now and you know you've been messing around and you need to get right with God, you need to get some things clean. There's a wonderful, happy invitation for you right now to come to Jesus and let him wash you. I'm gonna open up these altars right now. If you're here right now and you know that you need to get some things clean before the Lord, conviction is a gift. It's a wonderful invitation. Come and wash my heart. If you're here, you need to get clean. I want you to come down right now. You need some stains washed in your life. Come on. Who's bold enough to say, Lord, I know it. I know there's something here in my life. You don't want to reject the sweet conviction of the precious Holy Spirit. You don't want to. So you're here. You know you need something washed. Come on. Come, it's a wonderful invitation. 
and here you will find such sweetness. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna make it easy for you. I want you to turn to the person to your right, to your left, even if you know them, even if it's your wife, even if it's your husband. I want you to look at them and I want you to say, do you, do you need to come and, and get clean? Is there something you need clean? Just turn and ask them. And if they say yes, just help them come down here. No one, there's no reason for anybody to leave here not clean before God. Come, 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 come. It's wonderful. It is wonderful, guys. Wonderful. This is not a, he's not, he doesn't have an iron fist over your head. What he has is a love invitation for, for you. This is the word of the Lord. He says, let me wash you. Let me take, I'll take it from you. I, I'll, I can deal with it so easy. I just need you to come to me. Come to me, come to me, come to me. Come to me, come to me. Yeah, hear the song of the Lord. He sings, he sings over you. Come to me, come to me. Come to me. Oh, how precious is your love. Precious is your love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're switching things up here right now. Just begin to ask the Lord to wash you. Just, Lord, wash me, wash me. I know you want to cleanse me. I receive you. I belong to you. I adore you. Take my life again, Lord. Oh, da, da. If you're in your seat, just begin to worship the Lord. Just right there. Oh, how I long for you. Yeah, just personally. Just talk to him personal. Your own words. Oh, God, just wash over my heart. Just wash over my heart, my God. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Oh, 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 oh. oh. Yeah. Yeah, just ask him to forgive you for giving attention to other things. Forgive me for giving attention to other things. want to say, Lord, I want to be a Mary. I want to be captivated by you, and I want to give my entire life to just love exchange with you above everything else. If that's, if that's you, just kind of get somewhere before the Lord right now. You can just get on your knees right where you are. Just make a, a declaration to him by some type of an action. Oh, Lord, I want to be like her who captivated your heart, who who, who stole your heart, Lord. I want to be like this woman whose identity was not wrapped up in what she did for you, but in how much she adored you. <laughs> oh, I long to adore you. Oh, how beautiful you are. 
about everybody else. Ooh, na, 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 na. 